the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So today is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here who are here with us. And what you see here, okay, is that Jesus shows us his motherly side today as well. What does Jesus talk about here today? What does Jesus talk about? Food. Talks about feeding us, doesn't he? Talks about bread of life. And he talks about giving to us the bread of life. So you see, the motherly side in Jesus comes out as well. That I love my kids and I want to feed them and feed them and feed them and feed them. But the difference between Jesus' bread of life and our mama's bread of life, which is a different kind of bread, is that when Jesus says, <clears throat> anytime the Bible says life, like when the Bible says the bread of life, and in several readings of this today said like, he who believes in the Son has life in him. When the Bible says life, what's life? Clearly when the Bible says life, it doesn't mean just life on this earth. It doesn't mean just physical life. Okay, and the expression that I always say is a lot of times there's people who are alive but aren't really living. Everyone agree on that statement, right? There's a lot of people who are alive but aren't really living. Because there's life and then there is life. There's life. There's existing, and then there is the life when, like when Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly, okay? And he would tell them things like, because you don't believe me, you have no life in you. And they wouldn't get it. And they're sitting there breathing, their heart is beating, and their lungs are going, so they're alive, but he's saying you have no life in you. Then he's saying, if you believe in me, now you have life in you. So when the Bible says life, it doesn't mean just physical life, okay? It means something much, much greater, and that kind of life that he's talking about is the heavenly life, is the eternal life, is the life of heaven on earth, is the life in Christ, okay? It's not just life after we die. It's talking about life right here on this earth. And what the Lord is telling us here today is a very, this is why the Holy 50 is the best days of the year. The Holy 50 are the best days of the year if you, if you understand them, like, and you can get into them. They're the best days because all the Holy 50 is Jesus coming and saying, I'm not asking anything from you. I'm telling you what I'm here to give you. And he's telling us what he's here to give us. And today, we see he's here to give us bread. It's either next week or the week after. One of the weeks, we'll talk about the water. Okay, he's coming to give us the water that makes us never thirsty. And then we'll talk about how he's coming to give us light. So every week of the Holy 50 is Jesus coming and saying, this, because I rose from the dead, this is now what you have access to. And this is now the life that you should live. And he's saying, you should eat the bread of life. In the Pauline epistle, St. Paul said at the very beginning, it was Ephesians chapter 2, it was verse 19 through chapter 3. And he said, now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And then he goes on and goes on and goes on to speak about this like this mystery that has been hidden for so long and this mystery that we now have attained. And that mystery comes to us where it says, you also being built together as a habitation of God in the spirit. You also being built together as a habitation, I'm sorry, for a habitation of God in the spirit. What's the bread of life that he keeps speaking about here? What does this mean that we are members of, of the kingdom of God and the household of God right now? Jesus is coming to tell us today that he is coming. We talk about the bread of life. Who's the bread of life? He is the bread of life. And he's coming to say, you, I'm give, coming to feed you with the food that when you get to heaven, when you get to heaven, this is the food that you eat on a daily basis. Like he's giving us heaven on earth. And he's saying, when you get to heaven, this is the food that you're going to eat. And this is what, what, what's going to sustain you and nourish you. And he's saying, I'll give you a sneak peek. And I'll let you eat of it right now. And I'll let you... Put it inside you right now so that you can have that life inside you right now. So the bread of life that he's talking to us about, there's like two forms of the bread of life, okay? Because the bread of life is Christ. So anytime you talk about the bread of life, or you're talking about eating of, of the word of God, you talk about here, and you talk about here. Those are the two keys, okay, is here and is right here. And that's what the church always teaches us, is that to partake of here, you know, everyone's favorite rule about you have to get there before the gospel to take communion, okay? 
Why? Because in order to take here, you got to take here because you can't separate the two. This is the same as this. There's no difference between them. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. And what you see is during the holy 50 days, when Christ, after his resurrection from the dead, there was always breaking of bread and there was always expounding of scriptures. Those are the two themes that run through his many appearances after he rose from the dead. So the goal of our life is to partake of this bread and to have this life inside of us. But our message for today, what happens when you're walking and you're living, but you're not living? What happens when you're living, but you're not living? Or let me say it a different way, but you're alive, but you're not living. Like what happens when you are existing and you're going through the motions and you take communion and you read your Bible and you say your prayers and you go to church and you do all your things like a good little boy and a good little girl, but you're not living, okay? What, 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 what are you supposed to do in that situation? The best reading of today came from the Acts of the Apostles. Y'all remember the story from the Acts of the Apostles? Do you guys remember the story of the Acts of the Apostles? You should know the story of the Acts of the Apostles. I told you this is the funniest story in the Bible. And I told you every single time that this story appears in the readings, I will talk about it. Just out of sheer, it's the funniest story in the Bible. And you have to know this story because it's hysterical, number one. But number two, it teaches us a very, very beautiful lesson. There's a story of one time, it's in Acts chapter 20, when St. Paul was preaching. Okay, it'll get up there eventually. Okay, St. Paul, we'll skip kind of the beginning part. Get us down to like verse, get us near the end, like verse 8, 9, somewhere around there. So St. Paul is preaching to the disciples, okay? Not to the disciples, to, to a group of, of his disciples. And they're in this place, and they're staying together. And they came together to break bread. But the St. Paul began to preach, and preach, and preach, and preach, and preach. You guys wouldn't know what that's like, because we don't have that around here. We have short sermons, right? They began to preach, and preach, and preach. So much so that what happened? One guy named Eutychus, what happened to him? First, he fell asleep, which is bad in and of itself, okay? That's like the worst thing you can do is fall asleep during a sermon. I'm joking. And then not only was he like dozing, like your neighbor needs to wake you up, like usually when we doze, at least we hear glory be to God and we jump up again, okay? We at least can wake ourselves up. But he fell into such a deep sleep that the Bible says what? That he did what? Is it up there on the screen? Go up, page up, one second there. Page up. I'll read from here. Maybe you'll catch up there. It says, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. It's nice, isn't that nice? Who was sinking into a deep sleep. Some of you can relate to that. And he was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. I know we shouldn't laugh because the man died. But I'm talking about how boring does a sermon have to be to really kill you? To really kill you? That's what happened right here. St. Paul was preaching so much that the boy not just dozed, the boy was out, and St. Paul still preaching, still preaching, still preaching. Okay, that's when you know that you're doing a good job as an experienced preacher, and he's still preaching. The guy falls out of a window, and he dies. The guy falls, the guy falls out of a window, and he dies. This is like, imagine that someone dies during a sermon in church on a Sunday. This is like the worst thing that ever happened. But then here's the nice part of the story. But Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. For his life is in him. Was life in him, or was life not in him? Was life in him, or not in him? Yes and no. Physically, was life in him? No. Bible said he was dead. I mean, that's what the Bible said. So the Bible said he was dead. No life in him. But St. Paul said, don't worry, he's got life in him. How? Because there's life and then there's life. And what St. Paul shows us right here, okay, two, two lessons, okay. The first one is that he had no life in him, this earthly life. But St. Paul's like, it really doesn't matter because this is the life that you should be looking for anyway. And this is like a good lesson for us that this isn't the life that we care so much about and we're focused on in this life and this life. He's saying, 
Okay, he lost this one, but he still has this one, so we're okay with that. So that's like one lesson, but I don't want to focus on that one as much. The second lesson is that he lost this life. St. Paul says he still has this life. And then the next verse. Now, when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while. St. Paul went back to his sermon. Okay. When he had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive. And they were not a little comforted. What happened? This is a great story. This is a great story of the one who says, bah, like I'm trying and I go to church and I pray, but my life is just dry. It's just, it's, it's not really life. I'm just existing. It's not really life. And I'm not bad, like I'm doing the right things, but I just, it's no, there's, no, there's no life in my life. You know that feeling? There's no life in my life. There's no life in my life. Well, St. Paul today shows us that, that you can have no life in your life and find life in your life. Because these days are days of resurrection, where the dead come to life. And here we saw someone dead come to life. And here we saw someone who had no life receive life. How? What's the key? What's the key? What's the key? Where did he find his life? Where? When did he find his life? When? Let's say when, not where. When he had what? When he had what? Isn't it up there? When he had what? Broken bread and eaten. When he had broken bread and eaten. So when he had eaten the bread of life. When he had eaten, when he had broken the bread and eaten the bread of life, the life came back into him. So here's our message for today. Very simple, very straightforward for you. Sometimes you have life, but you don't have life. But Jesus came to give us life. And this day is a day where he's telling us, and especially if you read, if you read in the Ephesians chapter three, that passage that was read to us about this great promise and this great mystery and the gift of grace that God has given to us and his wonderful, wonderful, unsearchable riches and his great mystery. Like he speaks, St. Paul keeps on speaking and speaking about this great thing, this great thing, this great thing. And that great thing is that there's life. And even if you don't have life, you can have life. These days of resurrection are life. But keep your commitment to two things. Keep your commitment to the word of God and keep your commitment to the breaking of bread. Trust me, I promise you, stay committed to these two. Stay committed to these two and be consistent and be committed. Even if you're not feeling it, stay committed to these two. Stay committed to the breaking of bread and stay committed to the word of God. That's the church, the liturgical worship, and that is your Bible, your quiet time, your Bible study, whatever it is. Stay committed to these two and God will give you life. That's what these days are. It's him saying, I'm like the mother and I just want to feed and feed and feed and feed and feed and give you life. So I'm the bread of life. And you find me in these two things. If you're not feeling the life, then maybe what we need to do is change like... The only thing I would tell you to adapt is that we change like our perspective and our attitude towards the bread. What I mean by that is, is that sense of eagerness that we come to our Bible with. And that sense of like desire that we come to the breaking of bread with. Not just coming and going through the motions, but we realize that this really is the bread of life. And when I partake of this, when I partake of this, I'm in heaven. I am. Actually, let me say it better. When I partake of this, heaven is inside me. When I partake of this, heaven is inside me. So we should come, like the psalm said, with awe and with trembling and fear. and no, Not fear in a bad way, but the sense of, of that heaven is about to come inside me. And same thing when we approach our Bible. Like we need to approach the breaking of bread and our word of God. I think after Easter liturgy, I don't think I'm the only one. I usually don't drive fast. I usually don't speed. But after Easter liturgy, we all speed a little bit, don't we? We all drive like 100 miles an hour to get home to the meal, right? Because we're really anticipating it. Even though it's like a six-minute drive, I want to make it in five and a half minutes because those 30 seconds on that particular night are very, very, very valuable to me. And that's the way we need to approach this and this. The word here and the word here. Because Jesus says that's the bread of life. And the beautiful thing that he says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. He who comes to me shall never hunger. We want to approach this and approach this with a sense of this is my food. This is my nourishment. 
this is my everything and my everything. And if I get this, I never be hungry the rest of the day. I never be hungry the rest of the week. I never be hungry the rest of my life. So we approach it with that sense of eagerness and that sense of desire. Like what I'm trying to say in a nutshell, the more and more I go forward in life, the more and more I realize that finding satisfaction and finding that life isn't about like doing certain things as much as it is about following a certain person. We focus on doing things and we miss the person. So what I'm saying is follow the master around. Follow the master around with eagerness. He shows up here, come here eagerly and can't wait. He's not there, he's here, show up eagerly and can't wait. It's not in the stuff as much as it is in the person that we follow and finding him and finding communion with him. Glory be to God forever. Amen.